This Friday will mark exactly one year since an 18 year old was shot and killed in Wilmington and no one has been arrested. This morning we have newly released surveillance video from right before Zalex Johnson was shot to death. WWA White's Hannah Patrick sat down with police and Johnson's family to find out why his murder remains unsolved. Whether it was a game of basketball. He was a leader. Or checking on the younger kids in the neighborhood. He had a lot of people following him, looking up to him. 18-year-old Zaliex Johnson was always doing something at the Creekwood Learning Center. He would go up there every day and work with the kids and play games with them. Yolanda Hayes says it was a place where her son wanted to do something right, to make a difference in the Creekwood community. That was just him. He was just a loving person. Like, he was just, he wanted to make sure everybody was okay. But on February February 21st, 2019. That was the same place where everything went wrong. My best friend's sister came and just slung the door open and was like, come on, you gotta come on, it's ZJ. Hayes got news no mother wants to hear. Shots rang out in the Creekwood community. Sergeant Myron Irving with the Wilmington Police Department says it happened just after 11 that night. I remember jumping in the truck with her and going down the street, like, and seeing him by laying on the ground. Johnson was laying on the ground right next to the Creekwood Community Center. And all I could do was just call him, just call him like I was angry because I'm just like, ZJ, like, get up, because I, I want him to get up, but I'm just like, just like, come on, like, I'm calling you, like, if he hears me, he'll get up, but. ZJ never got up. I just remember his arm falling, and it was just like, my soul just like, felt like it left my body. That's when detectives started looking for a murder suspect. When we started retracing the steps, we, we know that the victim was hanging out with some friends. Sergeant Irving says surveillance video shows Johnson and his friends at the Prince Mini Mart about 30 minutes before they went to Creekwood. Looks like they're on maybe their cell phones. Irving says that could be where it all started. At the store, there was some type of Facebook Live video that may have prompted some animosity, possibly towards some, some, some rival gangs. Sergeant Irving says there were some gang ties, but he can't say that Johnson was a validated gang member. ZJ was never in the live video, never arguing with anybody. Irving says it's possible the gunshots might not have been intended for Johnson. I think uh, Zali X was definitely in the wrong place at the wrong time you know, possibly with the wrong people. Now he says the people at the scene won't talk. Some of these witnesses even had to duck and dodge bullets. We would have loved for them to have been a little bit more, you know, cooperating and, and just telling us, you know, what they saw. He says these witnesses were ZJ's friends. That hurts more than anything because my son is gone like forever. And there was so many people that knows who was arguing what the problem was. He says they want to retaliate instead of talk. Because it's all about, oh, we just want to do it ourselves. We want to get this person ourselves. But she says two wrongs don't make a right. That's not justice. Justice is looking that person in the face who killed my son and telling him that, you know what, I forgive you because you have a mother and that could easily be your mother's pain if somebody takes you from her and I know how it feel and I don't want another mother to feel like that. Johnson might have been in the wrong place at the wrong time, but she says it's time for someone to do what's right. To step up and talk and be brave like he was. He was so loyal to people. He was a good kid. Be brave, like do something for ZJ. Because ZJ was trying to do something right to fix what was going wrong in that same place. Whatever you have to do, if you have to text a tip, you have, whatever you have to do to get the word out there of what happened that night. Because it's not right for that night to remain unsolved. Tomorrow marks two years since the murder of a five-year-old in Pender County, but still no arrest. Now, according to an autopsy, Payton Fields was sexually assaulted and strangled on November 13th 2017, she died three days later. Yeah, the only known suspect in the case is getting ready to be released from jail on separate charges. Now, some of her family is speaking out for the very first time. 
WWE's Hannah Patrick sat down with Peyton's aunt in an interview that you will only see on WWAY. She always had a smile on her face. Every time I seen her, she was always smile and come run up to me and say, hey, hey, Riri. Marie Spaulding says her niece Peyton Fields was a very happy child with a bright future. She could have been an ex-president. She could have been Miss USA. But now they'll never know because in November 2017, at just five years old, Fields was sexually assaulted and killed. I'm like, who could have done this? Why? Why would they do that to her? Why my other niece was on the couch with her? Spaulding says Peyton and her sister were living with their grandmother and step-grandfather Dale and Lisa Hunt on Blackwater Drive in Watha. It had been two years since I haven't even seen her. They would never let me see her. Spaulding would never get to see Peyton again on November 13th, 2017. Detective John Leatherwood with the Pender County Sheriff's Office says Dale Hunt and Peyton's uncle, David Pravat, drove Peyton to the hospital. I have a five-year-old that was brought in, strongly appears to be strangulation marks on her neck. They didn't call the ambulance or anything. If something like that was going on, somebody should have called an ambulance for them to come. They could have done a lot more for her. Three days later, Peyton died at the hospital. Her sister's left with no sister. I'm left with no niece. My brother's left with no, no daughter. Six months later, the autopsy was released, revealing Peyton died because she was strangled, but no one was charged. Spaulding has been working closely with Detective Leatherwood. Some of the family has not. Nobody's really cooperating. Leatherwood told us the grandparents refused to accept the autopsy and claimed Peyton was just sick. The autopsy speaks for itself. They kept saying she died from meningitis. If she died from meningitis, um, her organs were never being donated to somebody that needed them. Pender County Sheriff Alan Cutler says they need someone to come forward so they can make an arrest. If there's any family member or any anyone in the public who has any information about this case or could shed any light on this investigation to please contact our office. Spaulding didn't want to say who she thinks was involved, but she did say this. The persons or the person that done it was at her funeral. And that person, the persons, touched her for the last time, taking her cast it to the grave. And that person was there, just no care in the world. In June of 2018, the Pender County Sheriff's Office named the uncle, David Pravat, as a suspect in the murder after they charged him with intimidating a witness and communicating threats. Detectives say while in jail on another charge, Pravat called his mother, Lisa Hunt, and threatened the life of the lead investigator in Peyton's death. It's kind of weird because why would you threaten the, the lead detective on the case? Spaulding says she doesn't know Pravat very well. I'm only met him once or twice. Do you know what his relationship was like with Peyton? Uh, I know both my nieces loved him to death. They loved him. Do you think he's capable of hurting Peyton? I'm not for sure. Spaulding now has full custody of Peyton's nine-year-old sister, Savannah. At first, in the middle of the night, she would have nightmares and she couldn't sleep. And, but now she's, she sleeps through the night. She just misses her sister. And while nothing will bring Peyton back to them. I want somebody to be charged because it's not right. She says it's time for some answers. it will give us some closure. But I want to ask the person why they done it. She was a five-year-old child. A five-year-old child killed in a brutal murder that remains unsolved. And we did reach out to Lisa and Dale Hunt multiple times for comment. We did not hear back. The only known suspect in the death of five-year-old Peyton Fields is out of prison today. Her uncle, David Pravat, has been serving time on separate charges, and police say he and his side of the family have been uncooperative in the investigation of Peyton's two, 2017 death. And tonight, for the very first time, Pravat's sister, Peyton's aunt, is speaking out. And WWAY's Hannah Patrick has his, her side of the story only on three. Time that somebody who was actually there and has been around her the whole five years she was alive speaks. More than two years after five-year-old Peyton Fields was sexually assaulted and strangled in Pender County, her mother's side of the family is speaking out for the first time. We, the maternal family, have been accused of not cooperating. Amber Leggett wants to set the record straight. We needed our time to grieve. We've never gotten that because it's always been news at the news at the news or this at the this we need our time that is why i'm stepping forward now leggett is field's aunt 
She is also David Pravat's sister, the only person of interest in the case. The accusations of it being my brother, I don't believe not one bit as much as he loved that child. Leggett says she was in Lumberton on November 13th, 2017, when Fields was taken to the hospital. I rushed as fast as I could to get there. Leggett says Fields' grandfather, Dale Hunt, and Pravat drove Fields to the hospital. 911 was called twice, but we did not get a connection. That's why they took off in the car to go drive. After Fields got to the hospital, a 911 call did go through from hospital staff. I have a five-year-old that was brought in. Strongly appears to be strangulation marks on her neck. Three days later, Fields died. The autopsy shows she was sexually assaulted and strangled. That's what it says, but honestly, I don't, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a medical examiner, so I, 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 that I honestly don't know. Leggett says she knows her family didn't do it. I feel like it to be a freak accident. We were told that at one point she was having seizures and now it's, oh no, she just died from strangulation. There weren't no seizures involved. In the report, it does say that she was sexually assaulted. I don't believe that. She was born with birthmarks. They are known as Mongolian spots. They come out looking like bruises. In June 2018, the Pender County Sheriff's Office named Pravat as a suspect and charged him with communicating threats to the lead detective on Field's case. Do you think that makes him look guilty at all? No, not after what was said and why it was said. People have their moments where you can push them to their pushing point. As Pravat is now being released from prison on those charges, like it says, she's still pushing for justice. And I want it to be the right justice, not the wrong justice. But she also wants some peace. There's been threats put out on the household with my daughter in it. I want the slander to stop, the threats to stop, let the law do what they got to do. She says it's time to move on. It's time for her to rest in peace. But she hopes Field's memory forever lives on. Like a happy little girl she was. That big smile, the beautiful eyes. For so many years, I didn't realize people were still looking. For 24 years, Tanya Kennedy has been looking for her mom, Tammy Ferguson, after she went missing in Brunswick County. She didn't always make great choices in the people she hung out with and maybe the things she did. I thought all this time that she wasn't being looked for and that her case was not important. Detective Felicia McCabe with the Leland Police Department says that's not the case. I've been involved with with this case prior to even getting into law enforcement. I've been an active member with the Q Center for Missing Persons. Now McCabe is investigating the case, becoming close to the family. They deserve to be able to find their mom. McCabe says Ferguson moved to Leland from Alabama in May 1995 with her husband, Benny Ferguson, for his construction job. Tammy received disability checks at the time from an injury at a textile company. She had actually lost a piece of her finger. Ferguson called her mom each month to get her check. Religiously, Tammy would contact her the first of every month. McCabe says they talked on June 1st, 1995, and again around June 22nd at a payphone. There used to be a phone booth that was right there on the corner of Oakland and Village Road. That was the last time Ferguson was ever seen or heard from, because on July 1st, she realized she hadn't heard from Tammy, so she gave her about a week. Nothing. She became very, very worried. That is when she called the Leland Police Department. Detectives searched the Ferguson's home at 114 Old Fayetteville Road. They found clothes that were still in the washer. They found social security checks that hadn't been cashed. There was also a Medicaid ID card. McCabe says based on all that, she wasn't planning on going anywhere, at least not anytime soon. But Benny wasn't there. He had moved back to Alabama. And Tammy wasn't with him for two to three weeks which is very strange. So of course, Benny Ferguson was going to be our main suspect. I didn't particularly care for him. I didn't think he was good for my mom. According to rumors, Benny talked about Tammy when he was intoxicated. Telling a lot of his family and friends and random strangers that he's the one to kill Tammy. But also, Benny was the type of person that when he was intoxicated, he liked to sound really bad and would make up stuff to make him look bigger and badder than he really was. McCabe says Benny is now dead. While he hasn't been ruled out, McCabe does have another theory. John Wayne Boyer, the serial killer from Brunswick County. She says Boyer killed three other people in the area. We know that he was here in this area during the time. Several different agencies put together a timeline on Boyer. It's 90 pages long. From the time that he was born to the time he was arrested in Tennessee. Is it going to be him? We're not sure at this time, but could it possibly be him? Yes. 
McCabe has one more fear. Benny could have been involved with the Dixie Mafia, and because of Benny knowing a certain crime that was committed, and Tammy having knowledge of that, um, we received information that maybe she was taken out. Now she needs your help. Someone had to have known or ran across Benny and Tammy at one point in time. Any little information at this point is very, very beneficial. They may not know who did it or if Ferguson is alive, but Kennedy still has hope. I do continue knowing in my heart she's gone, but at the same time I do have that little, you know, bit of me in the back that maybe something did happen, maybe she is somewhere still out there. She just wants answers. I would love for them to find her remains. That would give me the closure and I know it would help for my family. But no matter how much time has passed, or what Ferguson's past looks like, McCabe hopes her family knows. We spent two days out there in the rain. Someone is still looking. But until she's found, I'm not going to give up on this case. No one should have to bury their kids. Nicole Haskins never thought that would be her own reality after she took in four-year-old Melquan Hicks Bay and raised him as her own. He lived with me from the time he was four until well into high school. She says they lived in the District of Columbia. He didn't move to Wilmington until he was... 16 when his biological mother resurfaced they wanted to get to know each other haskins says melquan went back and forth he had several jobs in wilmington nothing permanent just chasing a dream he wanted to pursue music but she says wherever he was melquan made an impression he was a ladies man he was just full of life eventually she says melquan started a life in the port city he has children down there and so some things were just pulling him back. At the end of October in 2017, while in Wilmington, Melquan gave Haskins a call. Like he always does to ask for some money. So I sent him some money, asked how he was doing. He said he was good. He said he was coming down. That was the, the last conversation we had. The next week, Haskins got another call. This one from Melquan's biological mom. Asking had we heard from him because she had gotten a call saying that he was taken. New Hanover County 911. Someone came into my house with guns and took my phone and took somebody else. Detective Nicholas Lee with the New Hanover County Sheriff's Office says Melquan was the one who was kidnapped. The night before, Melquan had been out with friends. He had gone back to a friend's house there in the 1500 block of South 12th Street. And then shortly after arriving home, these two men burst into the home. Lee says Melquan was the only one taken at gunpoint. They did not take the other two people. He says one of them called 911 from a neighbor's phone. When I opened the doors, two guys with guns pointed at my face. They kept asking me, you know, where's the money? Who has the money? Like, they took everything everybody had. Six hours after that call, just after 10 a.m., another 911 call comes into the sheriff's office. That a body had been found in a wooded area off of Alvernia Drive runs off of Rock Hill Road in the Castle Hain area. Lee says the person had been shot multiple times. I identified him as Melquan Hicks Bay. I couldn't believe it and I couldn't understand what he could have done that would have gotten him in that situation. Lee says they don't know why, but they do think it was targeted. When the two men entered the home, they specifically asked for Melquan. Do you know if he had any enemies? Like, I mean, do you have any idea why? No, you know, he wouldn't back down from a fight if it was a fight, so I'm not sure, like, none that he expressed to us. No one knows why. Now they need your help finding who. There's two murderers that are out on the street still. The same person who killed my son could be out there preparing to kill somebody else's son. People capable of taking a life, a son, a father. He loved his family, he loved his friends, he loved his children. He wanted to do right for his kids. Kids who were so young at the time, Haskins says they may never remember their father. No, they won't know him eventually. He'll be a picture of somebody's shelf probably. Now detectives need anything you know to help paint the picture of what happened to Melquan Hicks Bay on November 5th, 2017. Anybody that saw him or talked to him after three in the morning, any of the slightest information. If they have information, they should talk or maybe that person should 
realize what they've done and just come forward. I doubt it, but wishful thinking wishing for the day her son's brutal murder will no longer be unsolved